Well, shalom, y'all. We finish up Ecclesiastes today with Ecclesiastes 12, and we get to see the uh, the big summary that Solomon is giving us. Now, remember, Solomon is contrasted living under the earth versus under the sun, the vanity of things in the earth that go away very, very quickly, and the things under God that endure forever. But then chapter 12, it's his final piece of advice. He has something for the young. He has something for the old, and then finishes up with some miscellaneous things that I think apply to us all. So let's join Debbie as she looks at Ecclesiastes 12 and takes a very, very personal journey through Solomon's final advice for life. Um, it's going to be really hard to teach this lesson this morning because it is um, about what life is about and um, that wise people recognize that time is a gift from God. And I think that's come home to me um, in the past 48 hours, especially. So um, anyway, just pray for me because it's going to be a hard one. Um, if you think about it, what would be one piece of advice that you um, would leave for your family and friends? Not a Bible verse. OK, but think about a piece of advice. Life is short. Yes, life is short. My you granddad. Know that when you're 30. No, you do not. My granddad used to say that this is my Texas granddad, that the closer you get to the end of life, it's more like a toilet paper roll. It just goes quicker and quicker, quicker and quicker. <laughs> and that I think that's exactly right. All right. I would say um, to enjoy life, you know, Sometimes we get overwhelmed by work and doing things like that that we miss out on the joy that's around us. I think that is a perfect lesson that goes right along with what we're going to see in Ecclesiastes today. All right, others. I try to impress on my daughter who is at the stage of life I was when I also didn't know how to say no when asked to do things say no. Build in time to do nothing. That you don't have something going on all the time. And why is that so important? I think it's important so that you you enjoy what you are doing right. and not crowd in so much that it's all an obligation. And that goes back to the issue of time, doesn't it? Okay, because you know time is a commodity that you can't replenish you know if you've got money in the bank and you it's wiped out there's an opportunity i mean it's devastating i'm not saying i'm not trying to minimize that that would not be a hardship but you have an opportunity there's a chance to replenish but time is that commodity it's gone it is absolutely gone so whether you're wasting it or investing it, um, I, I think it's something that I've tried to impress on my students um, because it's something that, that God has really impressed on me. Um, whenever I was teaching teacher cadets, I always used to give them a blank journal and there was um, at, at when they graduated and there was a song by Christian singer Chris Rice that I would put the lyrics in the front. And he said, that, you know, your life, your life is a book and you get to choose what you're going to write on each page. And you decide whether you're going to invest those moments and minutes that the pages represent in something that that matters or whether you're going to fritter them away. And I, I'm embarrassed to think about the number of hours that I fritter away um, and when I say fritter away, I'm not talking about being silent or reading. I'm talking about sitting in front of the television, you know, that kind of that kind of thing, uh, frittering away when in reality. And, and this is something that I think um, a lesson that that has been taught for me the last five years. People are the most important thing. And that that's where I need to invest my time. And instead of sitting in front of the television, why don't I call a friend? 
phone a friend. You know, even television tells you to phone a friend, phone a friend. Yes, actually talk on the phone. What? Yeah. That's right. But but you know what? It doesn't have to be the same friend every time. So if you if you spread it around, if you spread it around, then they're more glad to hear from you. OK, than if you're calling them all the time. But but uh, you know, just a hint. I don't know about your friends, but but, but you know, invest in people, because isn't that what Jesus did? He invested in people. That's what. All of his ministry, if you look at how he spent his time. Um, so, you know, I, I went back and I kept thinking about that. And you know, there's that little um, book that was by Robert Fulgham. It came out a number of years ago. Um, all I really needed to know I learned in kindergarten. OK, and he's got these chapters that are talking about these lessons that you learn when you're in kindergarten, uh, share everything, play fair, don't hit people. <laughs> I mean, those can be translated right into adult situations. And they're really the most important things in terms of how we spend our time. Number 11, live a balanced life. Isn't that about time and how we're investing? Be aware of wonder. Notice the joy in the things you see around you. All these things that we've mentioned are on that list. And so when we go to Ecclesiastes at the end, um, we've got kind of a summation from Solomon about essential truths for living. And there are three things that, that we're going to focus on in this um, chapter. Oh, it actually spans 11 and 12. But the first one is that if you're wise, and remember Solomon is, is supposed to be the epitome of wisdom. I know people argue with that because of the wives thing. But, uh, and I'm not negating that. But um, I think we would be wise to listen to what he's, he's come up with. That wise people recognize that time is a gift from God. And then wise people live their lives with a proper perspective of their mortality. And that goes back into what Linda was saying about people when they're 30 <laughs> look at it very differently than people when they're 65. Um, your window of opportunity is short lived. And then wise people enjoy the life and blessings that God gives them. So the three things that Solomon focuses on are things that that y'all would say, those are the things that, that came up in here with that. So, and I consider y'all some uh, pretty wise people too. So I think we ought to pay heed. Okay. So I'm going to read verses um, seven through 10 of chapter 11. Light is sweet and it pleases the eyes to see the sun. However many years a man may live, let him enjoy them all, but let him remember the days of darkness for they will be many. Everything to come is meaningless. Be happy, young man, while you are young, and let your heart give you joy in the days of your youth. Follow the ways of your heart and whatever your eyes see, but know that for all these things, God will bring you to judgment. So then banish anxiety from your heart, cast off the troubles of your body, for youth and vigor are meaningless. All right, so in verse seven, when he says light is sweet and it pleases the eye, light is equaling life there. Um, and you have you have a situation where he's, if I paraphrased it in verse seven, it's good to be alive or kind of that James Brown, I feel good. Yeah, you know, when you're young, that's kind of where you are. Um, and, and in verse eight, then he he reinforces that and he says, you know, that's OK. Rejoice in life, no matter how long or how short it is, that it's appropriate to enjoy this. So. Why? Because in the next part of it, what does he say is coming? Dark days. And in reality, the dark days, you know, it's not just death. It's getting there. 
you know, the idea. I'm going to have to get a Kleenex. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Sorry, when I get teary, then that, uh, that happens. <clears throat> That's not COVID. I've had a test, but <laughs> um, but the idea that even your sight grows dim. So the days of darkness, it's not just that everything is you know closing in on you, but literally, I I don't know how many of y'all wear aids for seeing. I can see some that we're in the cl same club, but yeah, you, you just. You, the light. You need more light to read. Yeah, it's the days of darkness, literally. Okay. So we're promised that there are dark days to come. But if you look at the last sentence of um, what we just read, let's see. Let me look at it again. In verse 10, banish anxiety from your heart and cast off the troubles of your body. What should happen though in those dark days as we age what does he say are we to be buried under them no okay again we need to keep things in perspective and the circumstances aren't going to set the value of your life so if you've got bad knees and you creak when you get up like i do oh my gosh i mean i really when you stand up and I hear things, you know, the snap, crackle and pop. And, you know, that shouldn't set the circumstances. You know, it's interesting you say that because when I read where youth and bigger are meaningless, excuse me, you don't appreciate being able to sit down cross-legged and get up. Uh, you know, I don't think it's meaningless at all. Okay. Well, but here's, here's the thing. It's like George Bernard Shaw said, Youth is wasted on the young. And that's it is. They, they don't appreciate that kind of thing. And you can't tell them. I mean, you can tell them, but do they listen? No. So, you know, and the best the best thing I can say is, you know, uh, them seeing those things maybe is a little more of a lesson than just hearing them. Uh, so that to me is. Um, a huge, a huge value in having a circle that's not just one age. Yeah, you know, that I remember when I went to um, Baylor, they had a college service. Of course, Baylor being the biggest Baptist university in the world, those churches, all those Baptist churches there had a pot of, of college kids that were pretty ingrained in coming to church. And so they would have a separate service. But I made sure that I went to a church that had different age groups in the service because I like to see the little kids and I like to be around the older people. And I think there's a real value in that generation. And I think that's part of the way God set us up. You know, he says the old teach the young. And in the New Testament, Paul advises the older women to teach the younger women. Well, if you've got them all segregated, who's going to be teaching? You know, you're kind of stirring around in your own pot of wisdom, which at 20 is not so deep. So that, you know, I, I think that's I think that's important that we need to, again, invest in those that are younger. And I think that's one thing that our church has done really well is keeping that multi-generational track. Um, now, verse nine, look at verse nine. Be happy, young man, while you are long, young and let your heart give you joy in the days of your youth. Interesting question. What group is happier and more content? The young or the old? Do you know? It's actually the old surveys show that the older you are, the more content you are content, content, I think, is different than what we may be thinking of in terms of happy. I think the young people think about that. They're, they're looking ahead. You know, I want to be like him. or I want to gain this. or I want to do that. And so they're not content in their heart. 
because they're striving. For the word striving is exactly what I wrote down. Yes, I mean we are we are on the same wavelength this morning. Okay, so striving, yes, striving, the striving. You know, I I see. Oh my gosh, I see in working with these these high achieving students how stressed out they are about what is coming. Oh my god, does it? <laughs> I'm not my grandson. <laughs> would you like to elaborate on not specifically, but you know, any he comes over to the house and he's thinking about everything he's got to do for college. He's a senior this year. He's got to do this, he's got to do that. And he's so stressed out trying to do this stuff. I can't even get him to come over to my house for one day and visit with him. I mean, they, he's just so ingrained and it feels like I don't know if it's the school system, the parents, or what, but he's just focused and doesn't have time for anything else. It's kind of sad. He is incredibly conscientious. He is not the only one. But they should all have a dose of practice. He's waited for the last minute to do everything. applying for medical school. He's applying for aerospace medicine and Ohio, and it's due Tuesday, and he hadn't even gotten all his references. And, you know, but he, he doesn't worry about it. He gets it done. I don't know how. Knowing Preston, obviously not as well as you do, but knowing Preston, Preston is very focused on things beyond work. His people are important to him. His faith is important to him. The the time outside and doing things he loves in nature, whether that's hiking or you know all things that I wouldn't enjoy, but Preston enjoys, and they they kind of rejuvenate him. He does those things and invests. He recognizes that. Um, I'd say he's probably done what Solomon has has suggested and found a balance, Maybe. but. But there, but there are a lot of older people who are in the same boat that haven't found that balance. You know, we are supposed to find the joy around us. Now we get a caution in the last part, you know, about, you know, be happy and let your heart give you joy. Follow the ways of your heart. Well, what should be dictating the ways of your heart? God, right? Okay, because if he's not then those things that um, make you happy, I'm going to say that's not the same as joy, but those things that make you happy when you're young could actually be disastrous in terms of choices you make. Um, And there are going to be things that God is going to hold you accountable for. And Solomon says, yeah, okay, do things while you're young, make yourself happy, but that is not go out and sow your wild oats in the way that the world thinks that's a good thing to do in your in your young days. But you will pay the consequence. Exactly. All right. There is a consequence. Um, you know, I, we were talking about how um, I was talking with a friend about how God is a God of order and justice. And it's one of those situations where if this happens, there's, you know, there's mercy in there, but there's going to be justice that comes. And the whole idea of justice for us as believers is mitigated by the grace of the cross. But not everybody's making that choice. And so that justice is going to come. Um, and so there's a word of warning there. But but the idea is that we should enjoy this life. I found a quote from um, a Jewish teacher from the third century. His name was Rab. I kept thinking if that was rap, short for rabbi, you know, I don't know. But this was this was his comment. Man will have to give account for all that he saw and did not enjoy. You know, God means for us to find joy in this life. He does not mean for us to go around. It says we're to be light in this world. And, you know, if you read the Gospels, Christ was a light. People were drawn to him 
to me, that says the man exhibited joy. He wasn't just a novelty. And I think we're to model that. The last portion of that verse, though, warns us of how we're to find that joy. Okay, and then verse 10. So then banish anxiety from your heart and cast off the troubles of your body for the youth and vigor are meaningless. So intentionally, we're going to have to work to get rid of grief, pain, anxiety, anger, and enjoy life no matter the circumstances because the circumstances keep us from unwrapping the gift that God has given us, which is life here, life eternally. And the idea that these things weighing us down in this life are permanent should not be a part of a Christian vocabulary or ideology because they're not permanent. Is this life permanent? Absolutely not. Gosh, arthritis keeps me from snapping my fingers like I used to be able to. Okay, so the summary of those verses is really, okay, seize the day, carpe diem, seize the day, take advantage of the time, make sure that you recognize that time is a gift. Okay, so there's the wisdom that he's coming through with um, there. And then verses one through eight of chapter 12 shifts us to the idea of time again, but it's the idea that time is going to come to an end. So you need to have a proper perspective on your mortality when we're talking about time and how it applies to us. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. Before the days of trouble come and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars grow dark and the clouds return after the rain. Boy, we can relate to that this week or the last couple of weeks. When the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men stoop, when the grinders cease because they are few and those looking through the windows grow dim, when the doors to the street are closed and the sound of grinding fades, when men rise up at the sound of birds, but all their songs grow faint, when men are afraid of heights and of dangers in the streets, when the almond tree blossoms and the grasshopper drags himself along and desire no longer is stirred. Then man goes to his eternal home and mourners go about the streets. Remember him, him being the creator. Before the silver cord is severed or the golden bowl is broken, before the pitcher is shattered at the spring or the wheel broken at the well and the dust returns to the ground it came from and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Everything is meaningless. Okay, as an English teacher, I love those verses because it's this amazing extended metaphor and it actually layers another metaphor, uh, uh, several other metaphors. So um, you've got this metaphor of a grand estate that has gone downhill. That's what you see. So that's the extended metaphor. And then if you take it um, verse by verse, then you will see how he's talking about time passing. Okay, so let's start with verse number one, when he reminds us how we're to live, how we live that very first part. Remember your creator when you're young. In other words, don't ignore God when you're young. And then you see again in verse six, remember him. There's another reminder. But at that point, you're at a different stage of life. But start when you're young, remembering whose you are. Um, When you are a young person, if you recognize and know your place before God, and recognize those truths about God, then you are are about life, that you are going to have a more joyful life and potentially a longer life because of the choice that you made and, and the fact that you got right with God to begin with. Okay? 
Um, I found a, a preacher named Adam Clark had looked at several important points to draw from that idea of remembering your creator when you're young. And what does that mean? And there were three things that I thought that were pretty significant. One, you are not your own. Just like we are a steward of God's blessings, we are a steward of this. I'm afraid I've not been a very good steward recently. I've been trying to exercise, but there have been a lot of birthday cake Oreos going in. <laughs> okay. So remember that you are not your own, that we are to be a steward of, um, of what God made us to be. He is my creator. He had the template put me into shape and then said, turned it over and said, you're responsible. So I need to make sure that I'm being responsible with the, the body that he gave me. And we just need to remember him. Don't get lost in the busyness and forget God. And then the idea of remembering him when we're young, what does God tell us to do in terms of giving and tithing? What are we supposed to do? Give the first fruits, right? In youth, the first fruit of a life. So if we're tithing time, then starting right off the bat is giving God our very best. That doesn't mean we don't have value as we age. That's not it. But we all know that we had a little more energy when we were 25 than at 55. You know, one thing that I was struck with is that was um, remembering your creator. My daddy, when he was dying, could quote scripture. He couldn't read it, but he could quote it. And I can't do that. Yeah. I mean, I do work at it, but. I can't do it either. I haven't put, I haven't made that a priority. And think about when the difficult days come. You need it. That's exactly right. You know, I was thinking about um, my phone or my iPad and how, you know, this at this point, I have um, I have my hard copy of my Bible back there. But what I use a lot is this electronic version. And it's so nice because I can say, oh, I've always got this. I've always got this. I've always got this. What if you don't? Right. What what if there's something that that somehow you don't have access to this anymore? Well, yeah, I've got a hard copy and I've got notes in there. But do I always carry that around with me? No, I mean, I don't. I, 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 I wish when we read it, we could just remember it. Right. <laughs> But again, I think about how many silly things I can remember and how many Jeopardy. How many answers can I give on Jeopardy for things that have. Oh, as you put it. Yes. Yes. And I actually knew that. I mean, I've got it tight here, but I knew that. Why don't I know scripture like that? Because. One of the reasons to sing to your little ones. Uh, I remember more scriptures since from when my daughter was little and we had these uh, salty and Mr. Donut Man. And, you know, I can do more of that. And I went to Sunday school all my life. Yeah. But I, and also to remember truths, not just, there's a lot of Bible that is uh, genealogy. Yeah. I need to remember that. No. But I do remember, I do need to remember God is love. I do, you know, just like that. And I think doing that for our children, our grandchildren, you get it hidden in your heart then. And it's always there. Right. Especially in song. That's exactly right. So that that investment in children, you know, if you want to find a church that is really doing the right thing, they're investing in kids. It doesn't mean they ignore other people, but they invest in kids. And I don't mean just entertain. 
but in growing them and develop, developing a foundation for them. And I think scripture is a part of that. So, um, verses, let's look at verse six. We're going to, uh, no, hold on. Yeah, okay, not verse six. We already talked about that. Um, two through five. All right, so this is where we've got the, the metaphor. And y'all, he's really, it's, it's a presentation of aging. That's what it is. So um, life loses its light. Okay. That's when you're getting older. You know, remember it says it's getting dark. And we already talked about the idea of that, that dimness. And it could be a loss of vitality, a loss of, uh, and there, there are people in, in older, the older age categories, especially men who suffer from depression. And I don't know if that has more to do with um, feeling like they've lost a purpose, but God, if God's got you here, he's got a purpose. Always. And if it means you're a prayer warrior, that is one of the most powerful purposes you can have. So you've got a purpose if you're here. It's up to you to, to adjust to a change purpose, but you've got a purpose. Verse three. All right. The keepers of the house tremble. Y'all, the keepers of the house. Those people working with the hands. All right. Washing the dishes, sweeping, dusting. OK. The, OK. Yeah. Linda has has yeah, pointed at Steve. All right. So it's talking about it's talking about the arms and the hands at the in the older years. They start to tremble. All right. The strong men bow down. What I go, What happens to your legs? Yeah. 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 OK, so you've got legs and knees and back that you you start to to stoop. You start to lose strength. Um, <laughs> the grinders cease because they are few. Now, I'm not going to ask to see base teeth, but that's what they're talking about. There we go. Joel's over here flashing his white pearly whites at me. OK. The eyes of the windows grow dim. What do they say are the windows to the soul? The eyes. All right. So there we go. We're talking about the eyes again. Can't see as well. Verse four, talking about the doors. All right. The doors being closed. Mouth. You don't have as much to say. Some do, but... <laughs> But generally, you know, I, I know that there are a lot of times when you talk to um, people, especially in in nursing facility, they don't talk. They don't have anything to say. It is hard when their world gets so small. Right. To keep a conversation. Right. And they're the ones that need it. Right. Exactly. Um, well, when they can't hear you, it's kind of hard for them to talk to you, you know. Well, okay, that's the next part of the verse. The sound of grinding is low. What happens to your ears? You can't hear as well. There you are. One rises up at the sound of a bird. Anybody have more problems sleeping as you age? I do. I mean, I used to be able to, it, it was nothing. I, I would carry on conversations while I was asleep when I was young. I would sleep deeply and I would sleep long. Uh-uh. Not at this stage. Um, it says the daughters of music are brought low. Sometimes you just don't find joy in some of the things you used to enjoy. Verse five, afraid of height and of tears in the way. Okay, anybody scared to get up on a ladder now? Anybody been warned by a child? Or a spouse, don't you get on that ladder. Don't get on that ladder when I'm not here. You don't need to be on that ladder at all. No, you're not cleaning the gutters. No, you're not cleaning off the ceiling fans. And sometimes stubbornness comes into play mm -hmm. with people who hear those words. But just remember, they're saying them for your own good. All right. You're less sure footed. You're less steady on your feet. I mean, literally, I mean, think about how many broken hips you hear about. With people stumbling and falling. All right. That's why balance is so crucial for working with older people. A lot of physical therapists will, will focus on balance. That's why I take Pilates. 
Um, the almond tree blossoms. Anybody know what color almond blossoms are? White. There we go. My almond tree has blossomed. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. So the hair becomes white. The grasshopper is a burden. A grasshopper is usually, you know, bopping all around all over everywhere. You could chase grasshoppers as you were a kid. Have you ever tried to trace a grasshopper now? Mm -hmm. Ain't happening. No, well, it didn't for me. As a matter of fact, I had to chase one yesterday. One got in the house and I was chasing after a grasshopper. I did literally. <laughs> I ended up getting it, but it was the shoe extension that got me. Uh, that, you know, and it was a slap. I didn't catch it. I just and I know you're not supposed to kill a cricket. And it was actually a cricket. But anyway, but you you lose yeah, you lose your your agility. All right. And then desire fails. I'm not going to say anything about that because I'm not married. So y'all deal with that on your own. All right. So you've got this sense of aging and then you get to verse six. And what ultimately is the case, that silver cord is broken. Life ends. The gold are severed. The golden bowl is broken. That's the body. You die. It ultimately leads to death. And I wanted to read something that I saw about this verse that I thought was really interesting. It's a rather gloomy picture that we see of old age. OK, this gloomy picture of old age does not negate the truth that old age can be a blessing for the godly. OK, so we don't need to walk away and say, OK, Solomon, yeah, old age, there's nothing to look forward to. We're all just going you know, downhill fast and it's just getting worse. Proverbs 16, 31 says that old age can be a blessing for the godly, but it serves. Remember his audience. Who is he talking to? The young. It serves to remind the young they will not have the ability to enjoy that blessing of godly old age and a life of strong service to God if they don't remember their creator when they're young. So, again, it's cautionary. It's a cautionary tale. All right. And then verses 9 through 12. Enjoy the blessings that God gives you. Not only was the teacher wise, but he also imparted knowledge to the people. He pondered and searched out and set in order many proverbs. The teacher searched to find just the right words, and what he wrote was upright and true. The words of the wise are like goads. They're collected sayings like firmly embedded nails given by one shepherd. Be warned, my son, of anything in addition to them, of making many books, there is no end, and much study wearies the body. Okay, so pay attention to the wisdom, but you need to be careful and not just focus on wisdom. You need to apply it and you need to know the author of the wisdom. We grow addicted to research itself. And I know people that do Bible study after Bible study after Bible study, and they pour over text, but it's like they aren't really getting to know God and they aren't making a difference in terms of applying that in their life. It says we grow addicted to research itself in love with our own hard questions. An answer would spoil everything. There are some people who don't really want the answer. It's just the digging through. True wisdom has its source in God alone. This is the source. I'm pointing to this. This is my Bible. There are hundreds of thousands of books written about the Bible. Hundreds of thousands. But any of those books that are written on any subject other than God's revealed wisdom. I keep thinking about like numbers in the Bible. I mean, think about how many, do you remember when we went through that phase where people were numerology and all? That's not what the book is about. And that's not what you're supposed to be getting from it. That leads to useless thinking. And that's exactly what he's talking about in verse 12. Of making many books, there is no end. And much study wearies the body. Pray for the revelation of an answer. It's there. Okay, so here's the real answer in 13 through 14. 
Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. This is it. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of a man. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. Sounds remarkably like what Jesus said, didn't he, about the most important commandments? First, what? Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. That's the key to all the commandments. Do those two things. And you've got wisdom and you've got the pathway for using your time and investing it wisely and appreciating the gift that God has given you here on earth. So um, and that's one thing I appreciate most about my friend David. And I really if you all would pray for him, he is one of the most godly men I know. He has prayed and prayed and prayed for me and my people more times than I can count and with me for other people. Um and he and his wife, they had moved to Florida, I mean, to Alabama and were establishing um, a Christian camp. So he was going to invest some more time in, um, in in bringing kids to Jesus. And I pray that he still has that opportunity. So we're going to all pray to that because we know we've got a God who makes a difference. So, Joel, I hate to ask you, but would you pray? I mean, not that I don't think you can do it. You'll do a lovely job. That sounded bad. <laughs> Heavenly Father, uh, we just thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for this part of Scripture that causes us to remind ourselves that when we're young, it's easy to get worried up, strive for things that a little of nobody. And once these things get ingrained in our lives, Lord, it's, it's hard. Things that are deep-rooted never never come up really with the first pull, but they, they don't. It takes a long time. So help us to be mindful of that while, while we're young. And help us to remember as we grow old, be content with where we are and what we've done. Help us to remember you, to walk with you, and to love you and honor you. Lord, be with uh, all these people that we've talked to today and and uh, who need our prayers, who need you more than anything. Let's pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.